Welcome, everyone. Thanks for joining us today. Um, I'm going to be talking today about Drupal and Gatsby JS. Uh, before I dive in, I'm just curious, how many of you have heard of Gatsby before? Almost everyone, wow. How many of you have ever actually built anything with Gatsby before? <laughs> Almost no one. Awesome. <laughs> cool. Um, why we're all here. That's, that's perfect. Hopefully I can fill in some of the gaps. Um, it's cool that it's such a small, intimate group today. Uh, my session's not going to be super long either, so I hope we can have a lot of back and forth. Uh, and feel free to interject with questions as you have them. I'll be demoing a couple things too, if there's anything you want to see more of or any of that. Uh, there's probably a lot of things I can fill in that may not be covered in the immediate presentation. Um, but for now, let's kick it off. Drupal and Gatsby, did we just become best friends? Uh, it's posed as a question on purpose, so we'll see. Um, Real briefly, the agenda, I'll, I'll do some intros, talk a little bit about the history of Drupal, of JavaScript, of static site generators. We'll talk about uh, some of the issues with decoupling Drupal uh, today, uh, how Gatsby aims to fill some of those gaps, uh, and then what the future of integration between these two technologies really looks like. So as for introductions, uh, I work for an agency called Third and Grove. Uh, we're a design first technology agency. Uh, we do a lot of Drupal. That's kind of our bread and butter wheelhouse. Uh, but we also work with a lot of other technologies as well. We do some WordPress work. We do a lot in the commerce space. We were big Magento partners. Uh, and now we also do a lot with Shopify, Shopify Plus, Big Commerce, Elastic Path, that kind of thing as well. Um, and we've been around for about five years. Uh, we're distributed all over the US uh, and we're hiring as well. So if you're looking for new opportunities, I'd love to talk to you about that afterwards. My name is Matt Davis. I'm the director of engineering uh, and I live in San Francisco. My background, I've been in the Drupal world for a long, long time. I've been a full-time Drupal person since 2007. Um, and I've actually done a lot in the decoupled space as well. Uh, that we'll get a little bit more into a little later on. So diving in here, let's just cover a little bit of, of history of how Drupal has evolved, how the web has evolved, all of that kind of stuff. Um, so really, I think historically we could say that the, these three things are pretty distinct. Uh, Drupal has obviously had JavaScript included in it for a long time in core. Um, but they've moved on very different trajectories. Uh, and static site generators as well have been around for a long time, uh, but there's been not a whole lot of cutting edge interplay between these three things before. Uh, so a little bit about Drupal's JavaScript history. Uh, like I said, I've been using Drupal for a long time. Uh, I remember when Drupal 6 was fresh on the scene and it had like aha form callbacks in it for the first time and we were all really excited that we could use that stuff without having to write any JavaScript, right? We got some of the power uh, that JavaScript provided, uh, but because of the way they had architected it in core, you could leverage that power without having to write the JavaScript yourself, uh, which, you know, back in the mid 2000s, that was a pretty big deal. That was super cool. A really I'm a self-taught developer myself, um, and I learned development through Drupal. Uh, and some of my first real deep dives into Drupal's APIs were through the forms API. So that kind of stuff, like the first uh, Drupal presentation I ever did publicly was about Ajax form state stuff for like Drupal six or five, you know, way back in the day. Um, so there's been a long history there. Um, Today, the, the current status of JavaScript in Drupal, uh, you, many of you probably know Drupal 8 ships with, what, what JavaScript libraries are in Drupal 8? Does anyone know? jQuery, what else? Backbone. Who, who here writes jQuery or has? Who here's written Backbone? Yeah. I have. <laughs> I, I would not do it again. Uh, and I try to avoid jQuery these days too. So part, part of that 
story here is that uh, even in Drupal 8, uh, which is the latest and greatest of Drupal, uh, we've kind of missed the boat in terms of everything else that's been happening uh, with JavaScript. So in the wider web development world, there's been a huge JavaScript revolution that's gone on around us in the last decade um, for many reasons that we can get into maybe some in discussion later on. Uh, but the reality is Drupal has massively fallen behind in that specific regard. Um, so if you try to hire a Drupal front end developer and tell them to write you something in backbone, anyone who's experienced with modern JavaScript is going to go find a different job because they're not going to want to write backbone. Uh, so that's the, the reality of the situation is uh, talented JavaScript developers don't want to write within the confines of what Drupal's existing JavaScript story allows for. And then there's these things called static sites. So who's heard of uh, Jekyll? What about Hugo? Those are probably the two biggest ones historically. Those are the two main ones I know about. They're both PHP based, right? There's one of them, Ruby. Ruby, yeah, that's right. Um, so they've been around for a while. They, they kind of have somewhat limited use cases in my view, um, but they had their place. Like if you wanted something uh, that didn't need a server, uh, that could be handy. You could serve a Hugo site from an S3 bucket if you wanted to. Um, it changes where the work is done, which is interesting. Like you do a lot of your work as a build step uh, instead of a server side process that's done at runtime. Um, so they have some interesting use cases, but for the most part, I feel like static sites are kind of not something that m most web developers have paid much attention to. Uh, in, in a way, it, it, they kind of almost bring you back to your roots. Uh, because I don't know who's been developing websites for a long time, but I remember writing static sites by hand, uh, just writing the markup directly into a, you know, a, a text editor and publishing that on the web. You know? um, so in some sense, the end product of what a static site generator gives you is taking you back to those roots of like, all we need here is, the, is our markup and our, and our CSS and our JavaScript. Um, Hence, everything old is new again. So then there's this thing called decoupled Drupal, uh, which has been a source of a lot of hype in the last few years. Uh, who here has built a decoupled Drupal project? A few of you, a few of you. Um, it's actually not a new thing. The first, like I mentioned, I've been a full-time Drupal developer since 2007. The first big Drupal project I ever built uh, was a Drupal 5 project that used XML RPC to communicate within Drupal to a Flash application, uh, which by today's standards, we would call that a progressively decoupled Drupal site. That, those terms didn't exist then, but that's basically what we built. Um, so these kinds of ideas have been around for a long time. I mean, you could even think of like an RSS feed that was being consumed elsewhere as a form of decoupling. It's, a, it's exposing your data that's driven by Drupal to some other technology to consume. Um, so that concept has been around for a long, long time. But with the modern JavaScript revolution, it's seen a new, a new life and a new energy breathed into, into this kind of model. That's one of the reasons. The other big reason is because what we're building in terms of websites has changed as well. And a lot of what a lot of the sites that we're building aren't being built just for a desktop browsing experience, but they also have a mobile application or a wearable device or an Alexa integration or whatever. All these different channels that want to be consuming the same data and want to be driven by a single source. Um, so that's another reason uh, for a lot of the interest and excitement around decoupled. Um, but there's some dilemmas as well. So having been in the decoupled space for a long time, maybe before I dive into this part, I, I can give a little bit more of my background there. Um, I mentioned the, the Drupal 5 decoupled Flash app, uh, but also I was one of the architects of the weather.com Drupal build, uh, which was launched in 2014. Uh, it was also progressively decoupled before that term existed. Um, but it was using 
Drupal 7 and Angular 1. Uh, and it was specifically built around the panels module. So the idea there was the weather.com team had a large in-house in team of JavaScript developers that already knew Angular 1. Uh, and they didn't want to learn Drupal. So our goal architecturally was to empower them to keep building Angular 1 stuff as fast as they could without getting in their way, uh, while still building this entire Drupal platform for them. Um, so what we built was a, a system that allowed them to write their little Angular pieces, uh, and then with a single little JSON file, declare that, hey, this is a thing Drupal should care about, uh, and it actually turned it into panels panes so that their editorial teams could then drag and drop these Angular widgets around on pages and lay them out. Uh, all that to say, it worked pretty well, but it was complicated. It was, it was a really complex system that we had to build to cater to their JavaScript team, their editorial teams, and the Drupal developers uh, that were building this wider, wider system. Um, so I think the first thing to keep in mind when you're thinking about decoupling uh, or considering it, especially for a project, is inherently, by default, decoupling a Drupal site increases your stack's complexity. You're introducing another different new technology on top of Drupal or alongside Drupal uh, that makes it more complex. So if you're going to go down that road, you should have good reasons for doing so, not just because you're curious about what all the hype's about. Uh, and want to play with it. Do that with your own personal portfolio site or something, but not for a client site. Uh, so I actually spend a lot of time talking people out of decoupling as well. And here's some of the reasons. When you decouple, what is it exactly that you leave behind? So I think of Drupal as a very powerful and flexible monolithic CMS. So it has everything baked into it uh, that you can get really excited about. It's got all of your content modeling. It's got all of your editorial forms. It's got all of your SEO and meta tag tools. It's got all of your path aliasing. And on the front end, it's got its entire rendering and presentation layer that's deeply integrated with all that stuff. So if you're logged into a Drupal site from the front end, you get all your little handy, click this, hover over an area on the page, and it shows a little widget that you can click on to edit that thing. You have your all of your contextual editing tools. You have previews that are built in uh, where you can see exactly in real time without publishing a piece of content, what it's gonna look like, and then go back and change it and, and go back and look at the preview again. You leave a lot of that behind if you decouple. And it's not that any of those are unsolvable problems in a decoupled world, but now you have to solve them again. That's the thing. With Drupal, you just have the solution handed to you. When you decouple, you have to be more thoughtful about how you're going to approach these things. How am I going to make my URLs respond to a change in the title of a node if my URLs are being driven by React routes? Um, how am I going to make sure that my editors, when they're looking at a page in my React app, can easily edit that page back in Drupal? You've got to figure out how you're gonna make all of that work again. And then there's some complexity around how you actually get the data out of Drupal. Um, so in Drupal 8 today, we have a few different options. REST is in core. You can build a view that exposes all of your views results as JSON. Uh, now, just as of recently, we have JSON API in core, which is super exciting. Um, I've been using JSON API for several years now. Um, JavaScript developers have a love-hate relationship with JSON API in, in my experience. What's nice about it, uh, how many people here have used JSON API actually? A few of you. So JSON API is a REST interface. Uh, it is a type of REST, but it's built on top of a, a specification that makes it very easy to reason about the structure of the data that's gonna be exposed. So if you've built things that are consuming uh, a traditional REST API, one of the complexities there is whoever's building the thing and the people build it, whoever's building the consuming application and the people building the REST API have to go back and forth about what's the structure of this thing gonna look like. And they have to agree on that 
and you're basically trying to build a bridge at both ends and make sure it meets in the middle. Um, whereas with JSON API, because it is a very strict specification, you know, even before you've created all your content types and stuff, you can say, these are the fields we're going to have. And the people on the front end can know exactly what the structure of that data is going to look like in advance before it even exists, because it's always exactly the same. Uh, so that's a benefit of JSON API. The cost of that structure is that it's very verbose. You're often giving out data that's not actually needed by the consuming application. Um, it's very inflexible because it is a set standard that everything has to adhere to, et cetera, et cetera. So it's a trade-off, um, but it does have some serious advantages. And what's really nice about it in core is you turn it on, there's no configuration, there's no playing around with settings or anything. All of your content types, everything's just there ready to go. Um, so in, in that regard, it's really nice to just be like, hey, let's play with some APIs, turn on JSON API, and React people or whatever can just start playing with it. Those APIs are just there. There's this other option too called GraphQL. I think it was mentioned a little bit in the last session. Who here has heard of or played with GraphQL before? A lot of you, okay, cool. Um, GraphQL is what most uh, modern JavaScript developers probably would prefer to be integrating with. Um, it was actually built by the Facebook team as well, uh, similar to React. Um, and it gives, it really changes in my view, I think of it as changing the, the power dynamic of who's declaring and who's determining your APIs. Because in GraphQL, uh, the people that are querying for the data actually are determining and writing the structure of the data they want. Uh, and so when you queer, make a query in GraphQL, you're declaring the exact structure of the data you want, and the response you get back is in that same exact structure. So you actually have full control over exactly what you want and how you want it structured. Um, so in that regard, front-end developers, JavaScript developers love it. But the problem here we see is we've got a lot of options and it's hard to choose, right? This is, I think this is one of the fundamental problems in decoupling Drupal today is just, there is no best practice. There is no straightforward way of how do you decouple? How do I know what's right? So much of it's driven by what are my business requirements? Who are my stakeholders? It's really hard to give like a one step guide to how to decouple today because of all this. So now there's this new thing called Gatsby. Some of what's fascinating about Gatsby, it actually, in a, in a weird way, it actually comes out of the Drupal community. The creator of Gatsby, Kyle Matthews, worked at Pantheon for like two years. Um, and then he ran off and got really excited about modern JavaScript. Um, but there's this interesting gap uh, that I noticed as well. Um, I spent a long time in the Angular community and I would go to ng-conf, the, the big Angular conference every year, as a Drupal person, which is weird. Um, and then I'd go around being like, talking to these JavaScript developers, like, what, what CMS do you use? What's a CMS? Oh, I think our marketing team has like a WordPress thing somewhere back in, back in a closet or something. Like, JavaScript developers don't typically care about CMSs. They don't think that way. Uh, and it's a, there's a gap there. So Gatsby is, is unique, even now, even now that it's been out a couple of years, in the JavaScript world, because it was built for APIs. It was built to be driven by API data. Uh, so in that regard, it's really powerful. Now, early on in the Gatsby days, it was talked about as a static site generator, which is why I brought those up. But really the creator kind of rejects that uh, categorization. I think calling Gatsby a static site generator is really limiting to what it actually does. Because what Gatsby is, is it's really, it's a React application. Um, it does generate static pages, but because it's React, you can also do as much dynamic fun stuff as you want on the client side. Um, so this may look like a lot of jargon to you. Does anyone know what CRA is? That's create React app. So React, the React library uh, by default comes with CRA 
And it's kind of like a scaffolding tool, like a really quick, easy way, like a CLI tool uh, to just scaffold out a quick React app. Um, but React is a library. It's very small. It's very unopinionated. Um, Gatsby's not. Gatsby's more opinionated. It puts more guardrails in place. Uh, it, it puts more ideas about how you should use React in place, which is really important for me as a engineering director. If I'm going to start training my Drupal engineers up on React, part of the problem there is like every React application, especially big React applications, complex React applications, they're all very different. JavaScript developers are very opinionated and they like to do things lots of different ways. And the JavaScript world is changing so fast that it's easy to just get lost in arguments about, should we be using Redux or Context API or, oh, now we have React hooks. Like, well, there's all these different options. What are we gonna use? Um, that's, that doesn't help when you're trying to standardize on a new technology. Having guardrails in place helps ease people in to new spaces in a, in a more, uh, in, in a way that they can learn as they go and slowly peel back layers of complexity if they need to. So I, I think that this is a great uh, definition of what, what Gatsby's power is. It's a much more opinionated way of beginning to use React that has got built in. SSR is server side rendering. Um, but unlike a Drupal application, where you're making calls to the server at runtime and hopefully caching those with varnish and a CDN and all of that. Um, all of the server side functionality of Gatsby is done at build time. So there's actually no server involved once a visitor is, is using your Gatsby site, unless they're making a separate HTTP request back to some API endpoint or something like that. So there's no server. So just like Hugo or Jekyll, you can host a Gatsby site in an S3 bucket. Doesn't matter. You don't need a server at all, as long as you have a CI tool that does the server side rendering piece. And that's how we, ho we host a lot of Gatsby sites. On, we use Netlify a lot, um, but I've hosted them in S3 buckets as well. <clears throat> and as I mentioned, key piece here is that it was built with CMSs in mind and API integrations in mind. Um, so what that means, it's API driven. Gatsby is fast by default. Now, what do I mean by fast by default? I'll show you a few different ways. First and foremost, though, this is for end user experience. So when you create a new Gatsby site, the way Kyle Matthews, the creator, talks about it is in, in Drupal, you have to put in work to make your Drupal site fast. In Gatsby, you'd have to put in work to make it slow. It's hard to make it not perform well. You have to do something wrong to make it not perform well. By default, when you create a new Gatsby site, uh, I don't know if anyone here is familiar with the Lighthouse audit tool that's built into Chrome now. You can audit performance and SEO and things. The performance score of a Gatsby site is 100 out of the box. Uh, and that comes with all of the modern tooling that the wider web development world takes for granted that's actually hard to achieve in a lot of Drupal sites today. Things like uh, having service workers that make your site offline capable. A Gatsby site by default, you can, once you visited a Gatsby site, you can turn off the internet and still use the entire site. It works completely offline. Um, things like uh, intelligent prefetching of static assets. So feeding your Google Analytics data back into your bundler so that it knows, hey, if a user's on this page, they're likely to go to this page next. So let's go ahead and start loading when there's idle network time, the static assets we're gonna need for that next page so that when they hit that link, it'll be immediate. Things like that. Um, so it's really thoughtfully built in a way to make it really fast for the end user experience. It's also fast to develop with, uh, which actually I'll take a brief halt there and do a little demo. Actually, I think the next slide is gonna. Yeah. So I just spun up a brand new Gatsby site here. 
And I am using the CLI tool, so I'm just going to type in Gatsby develop. That'll spin up a local for me. Side by side is going to be tough with this resolution, isn't it? Yes, it is. Break something. So from typing npm install g Gatsby CLI, creating a new Gatsby site, this is it in the code. But I want to show you how responsive just the developer experience is here. So I wish it was, I wish I had the resolution to do this a little better. Try to scoot this over. So type something in, hit save. Hey, there it is. How long does it take if you're updating a Drupal theme to wait, to go check, to reload the page? Just having this kind of instant feedback loop, it's crazy. Just your development can move so much faster because of that alone. So this is another aspect of fast by default is like, this is what modern web developers expect to be able to do is spin up a local in 10 seconds, start interacting with it and have a real time keystroke by keystroke live refresh if that's what they want. That's really hard to attain with Drupal. So let's talk about some use cases. The biggest and foremost one is when performance is paramount. Um, if you want to build the absolute fastest possible web experience, without putting in a ton of extra effort of getting all of your, your Drupal cache keys just right and your varnish just right and your mem cache and your CDN layers and all of that just right, use Gatsby. It's great. When you want a super easy CI pipeline that every time you make a push to master, it rebuilds in about three minutes and then suddenly you have your updates on your site automatically, Gatsby's awesome at that. When security is paramount and you have someone breathing down your neck about all of the vulnerabilities that come with the Drupal or a WordPress and all the concerns about making sure someone's there to update Drupal as soon as a security release is updated, Gatsby doesn't even have a server involved. You can have Drupal in the back end that's completely locked down that only your editors even have access to and as far as the public's concerned, they're just interacting with static HTML, CSS, and JavaScript. Now, obviously, you still have some JavaScript security issues, cross-site vulnerability things that you have to concern yourself with. But compared to having a live server that your public's interacting with, your, uh, your overall threat model is a lot reduced. Uh, content changes less often. Now, this is an important one because Let's be real, I've been talking about a lot of the good stuff about Gatsby. We're going to get into some of the concerns, but one of them is uh, time to update, right? Um, so let's go back to the weather.com example. One of the constraints there with the editorial team, you know, normally, I don't know how many of you have spent time on, on weather.com, but a lot of what they publish is kind of like clickbaity stuff like the top five cute dogs in a snowstorm or something like that. Um, it's not that important that those kind of articles get updated really rapidly. But when there's a major weather event that's happening and a hurricane's about to change trajectory, the winds have changed and the prediction model has changed on where a hurricane is going to go, having the ability to get real-time updates out on the site with minimal friction literally could save lives. So going with something like Gatsby, where you have a build time of however many minutes just to get a new article out on the site, eh, that might be risky. So if, if having immediate content publishing abilities is paramount, Gatsby's today probably not your top option. And the other obvious reason to use it is when 
you just have a dev team that prefers React. Um, this is something that comes up in a lot of our client pitches where we, you know, as an agency, Third and Grove tries to make ourselves very fireable. We want to build something that we can hand off to our clients, to their teams, to be able to support longer term, if that's what they want. Um, oftentimes, they don't want to, they don't have Drupal developers, or they don't want to have to try to find Drupal developers. That's a very niche, uh, a niche specialty to try to hire for. So if they already have React teams, which are quite common these days, then that's another good reason to build something uh, potentially in Gatsby. I kind of already talked about this a little bit, but uh, Gatsby is really great for easing Drupalists or people coming from other technologies into React for some of the reasons I mentioned, just how easy it is to go from nothing to an actual application that you can interact with. It's so quick. Um, also compared to starting from total vanilla React, you don't have to think about how are my Webpack bundles gonna work on this thing or what is it going on inside of my package.json or there's a lot of layers hidden from you by default in Gatsby that you still can access and you can still modify, but it gives you that ability like peeling back those layers of the onion that if you're just easing your way in, you get a very slim surface to interact with and you can start modifying components very quickly. But then when you're ready or curious to go deeper, you can very easily do that. So I think for me, again, as an engineering manager, that's very appealing to a team that's not that familiar with a lot of React stuff. It's like, how can I ease my developers in to learning this stuff slowly over time? So this is it. Four commands to go. This, I, I guess this assumes you already have Node installed, but uh, four commands to go from never using Gatsby before mm -hmm. to having a Gatsby local running that you can interact with takes, depending on your network connection, because you got to download from NPM all these packages, takes, you know, less than a minute probably. So you should try it. <clears throat> and like I mentioned, uh, Gatsby was built with API integrations in mind, but an important aspect of that to uh, emphasize is that you don't have to integrate with just one either. So like I, like I said earlier on, Third and Grove builds a lot in the commerce space as well. And for a lot of our projects historically, take like a Magento and a Drupal build, which we've done many, many sites that use both Magento and Drupal. And we had a few options that we typically offered our clients, which were, do you wanna build side by side, which is where you have a Drupal site and a separate Magento site, and you try to make them look close enough like each other, that it's not obvious to users that they're being actually passed back and forth between two totally different technologies kind of sucks. Or we did a headless commerce approach where we were using Drupal to query all of Magento's APIs uh, and pull stuff into Drupal that way. But with Gatsby, there's another option where Gatsby is actually doing all of the API querying itself using its source plugins. So you can pull in whatever data from Drupal you want pull in whatever data from a Magento or a Shopify or a WordPress or a big commerce that you want uh, and still have a unified front end experience built in React uh, that's integrated with all of that. That's now being referred to by the Gatsby team as the content mesh where you can have a bunch of different backends that are all feeding into a single Gatsby site. So looking ahead, like I said, we need to get into a little bit of where the, where the gaps are, because the reality is Gatsby's new, um, and there are things it doesn't do super well today. So uh, one thing that it's important to emphasize here is the editorial experience and what's lost there when you go decoupled. Um, things that editors are used to having, I mentioned contextual edit links, that's a tough solve. You got to build that stuff manually again. You're going to have people authenticating from Gatsby back to Drupal, that kind of thing. Another important one, hard problems left to solve, I guess. Build times. Um, so 
right now today, if you have a couple hundred page Drupal site, Gatsby build time may be two, three minutes. That may be fine, that may not be. But you know, a lot of us are building Drupal for big enterprise clients now that may have tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands of, of pages, nodes, images, different content types, multi-site, tons of content potentially. Build times in those kind of cases, probably untenable today. So you probably wouldn't want to use Gatsby today for those kinds of sites. That's the reality. So it is, it is very much still early days in that regard. Now they're working to solve these problems. Like today, there's no such thing as incremental build. So the way that it works, the way the uh, Gatsby Drupal source plugin, for example, works today, uh, it's using JSON API. And when you run a build in Gatsby, it's gonna go through every single node, every single entity type, make different separate HTTP requests for each one of those uh, to get every single piece of data from your Drupal site and build that out into React components. That's gonna take a while. And it's gonna do it every single time. So if you update an article and trigger a new build, it's gonna make an HTTP request to every single content type, every single node, et cetera, et cetera. It's not really tenable today. They're working on incremental build though. And actually Third and Grove is working with the Gatsby team on some of that as well. The nice thing is a lot of the tools are already there for us. So because so much is storable in configuration now in Drupal 8, uh, creating a sync API is actually what we're working on, where you can just expose the content that's changed at an API endpoint. The Gatsby can then just make a request that says, hey, what's different since the last time I built and just pull that new stuff in. So that's coming and then sometime in the next few months. But today that doesn't exist. So right now the builds, especially for large sites, are gonna be slow. Uh, and you're gonna pay, you're gonna be doing more work than you really need to be. And what about preview? Well, this is something that uh, has different decoupled sites have tried to solve different ways. It's never existed before for Drupal and Gatsby, but it's another thing we've been working on. So if this will cooperate, I'll show you what it looks like. Of course, we have this tiny resolution issue again. Let's see if this will actually work. And this is not a local test either. So I'm paying some network latency fees here. This is a out of the box Drupal um, Contenta build using the Umami theme uh, that's currently hosted on Pantheon. Uh, and then we have a Gatsby preview running. This is running in the Gatsby cloud services. And let's see if this will actually work. As I'm editing content in Drupal, hey, look at that. Keystroke by keystroke. Preview of the actual Gatsby site. That's actually the first time that's ever been publicly demoed, so I'm glad it worked. <laughs> So right now, this, this, uh, this idea actually came out of uh, discussions with Kyle Matthews at DrupalCon. So it's really been built, when was DrupalCon? A month and a half ago. It's been built in the last month and a half. Um, this piece is not open source yet, uh, but we're working on turning it into a Drupal module uh, and something that anyone can use uh, for any Drupal and Gatsby integration. So that will be coming very soon. And that was my demo. Uh, and that's about it. I think I went right at time. So we might have a few minutes for questions. Anyone have anything? Uh, Tim, well, that's the last thing. It says that end users are used to sort of the client changes and then submitting all those changes at once, whereas you were just typing in a field without any kind of event and action. Mm. Yeah, that's, that's a great question. So the question was based on the preview demo I just showed where keystroke by keystroke changes are appearing 
how do you know when that's actually published? When does that go live? Um, great question. So the answer to that is that preview instance in Gatsby that we were just looking at is that wasn't the production site. That was a, a specific preview version of the Gatsby site uh, that's up to date with the production site but would, it would never directly impact production. So you can make as many mistakes there, you could change whatever you wanted, change your mind as many times as you wanted, get that instant feedback loop, but then just like you're used to with Drupal, once you actually hit save on the node is when it would use a webhook to trigger a rebuild uh, and push that change to, to production. Yeah, great question. Yeah. We use Netlify a lot. Um, Netlify works really well with Gatsby. The, the, it's just so simple to, you take a, a GitHub repo, feed it into Netlify, and it will automatically set up CI for you so that any time a push is made to master branch, it does the build for you now. Um, it's free. It's free unless you're doing something super large scale. Um, so for most smaller sites, you can use Netlify completely for free, including like HTTPS and other cool stuff. Um, I kind of alluded to it there, but Gatsby's working on their own cloud services platform as well. Um, so we may see that emerging more. But like, like I said, we, I have hosted production uh, Gatsby sites in an S3 bucket too. It works fine. Yeah. Any other questions? Uh, we use the, typically we use the build hooks module, which is super awesome. And you can connect it to different environments. So you can have like a, a test or a dev environment set up as well to trigger things from. Yeah. Do you think there's a way where you could set that up to where it wouldn't just trigger a build because you pushed save on that particular node? In other words, where it would save it, you still be able to have that preview site. So this kind of helps to solve the content staging yeah so so the question was about how you could integrate different kinds of workflows or content staging into this kind of model uh, absolutely you could do things like that um, that's that that would actually be a lot of fun to, to set up, but it, that's actually not a ton of work where you could have a separate instance of the Gatsby site somewhere um, that would get published to immediately, but then have a mechanism for triggering uh, the production builds only when ready. Yeah. Cool. Well, I think we're right at time. I'm happy to answer any other questions after this. Thing. Thank you, everyone.